My name is Frank and I'm an alcoholic. I can't imagine that I would do that. <laughs> and you said it exactly right. This is about surrender and willingness. And more miracles happen in these rooms than any hospital or cathedral in the world. And if I went into your church, I would not wear my hat because I would honor the fact that it is your church. And if I went to the White House, I would not sit with the president with my hat on. More miracles happen in these rooms than in the White House and in any cathedral, any hospital in the world. And sooner or later, from the very beginning, if we just practice some surrender, because, alcohol, because recovery is a continuous series of surrenders. It starts with day one and it ends the day we die. Because I'm an alcoholic and that means that I have trouble living. For me, living is hard, sober and drunk. I don't know where the book of how to live I never got that book. And, and when you stood up, Patty, with 40 years, I felt sad. And when I stood up, I felt sad. You and I have more, 20 years more sobriety than the founders of Alcoholics Anonymous. That should not be the case. You should not be the oldest person in this room. Because when you came in, I'm his sponsor. When you came in, every room was full. When I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, every room was full. Every conference was full. Every meeting was full. There were thousands and thousands of meetings just in Chicago. Where are they? Where are those guys that fill the rooms? They're gone. And sometimes the new guys, the new people, they don't realize what's at stake here. Most of the people that come to Alcoholics Anonymous leave Alcoholics Anonymous. Most of the people who come to Alcoholics Anonymous leave Alcoholics Anonymous. Not because Alcoholics Anonymous doesn't work. That man read it. Rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. But most of us won't do it because our case is different. Most of us will read, remember, and discuss the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, but we won't take them. On November 3rd, 1971, I was the newest person in Alcoholics Anonymous. I had 10 hours. And when I walked in that first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, they gave me a book that said there's over a million people in Alcoholics Anonymous. So then I was no dummy. I thought to myself, there's a million people with more time than I have. Right now, I'm in the 99 percentile. 99.3 of all the people in Alcoholics Anonymous in the world have less time than I do. That could not happen if the people who were here then had stayed. That's what this is about. And some people I heard today, oh, I might die or go insane. And I understand that that's one side of the coin. But the thing that, the worst thing about alcoholism is this. Chances are it won't kill you or drive you crazy. Chances are you'll have to live with it for 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 years. That's the curse of alcoholism. Living with the filth, the regrets, the shame, 
the dirties, the secrets, the conduct, the fears, the hopelessness, the anger, year after year after year after year. They call that alcoholism. Now that we've had our fun, <laughs> they're selling tapes in the back. There's a fellow. They're, they're selling tapes here. There's a fellow who just died who was a warrior of Alcoholics Anonymous, and some of you have never heard of him. His name was Don Pritz. If you've never bought a tape at an A conference, ask for Don Pritz's tape. He just died. There's a word in the English language. It's called gentleman. He was a gentle man and a warrior in Alcoholics Anonymous. So whatever little I say tonight is going to be in remembrance, in memory of John Pritz. I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to be at any meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. I shouldn't be here. No one would have bet a nickel on November 3rd, 1971 that I would be here today. At my second meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, which occurred on November 4th, 1971, the person who brought me to the meeting was asked by the people who were at the meeting never to bring me back. <laughs> That's true. I don't know what I said. But they did not want to hear it again. <laughs> as far as I know, I'm the only newcomer that ever caused a group to have a group conscience meeting right there on the spot. <laughs> and the result of which is don't bring him back. <laughs> when I was 25 years sober, was it George, my 25th, I think, George and I went back to that meeting. None of them were there. <laughs> and the devil in me was happy about that. <laughs> Over the course of years, I have, uh, I've had the good fortune of speaking with all the legends of Alcoholics Anonymous. And there's a lady that I used to be on programs with, and she used to say, I love everyone in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I love everyone in Al-Anon. And I would just go crazy every time she said that because I don't love everybody in Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't even like everybody in Alcoholics Anonymous. And there's about 60 people from my home group and I'm going to tell them something that's going to shock them. There are people who don't like me. <laughs> I know you can't picture that, but what binds us together is not that we love each other or like each other. What binds us together is that we need each other. We need each other because our strength comes from our sharing of our weaknesses in all the colors of the rainbow. And too often in Alcoholics Anonymous, you find groups that are bound together by the dislike of other groups. That is not Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't know what it is, but it's not love. 
or caring or sharing. I've only missed one talk that I've ever taken out of the hundreds and hundreds of A's talks I've given, and I was, I was fogged in at Midway Airport 30 years ago. And I had a call, and I hadn't taken the brochure with me, so I didn't know the name of the contact in the city that I was going to talk, going to talk at. And I just show up and they meet me at the airport. And you know how that is. You, just, you don't know where you're going. So I didn't know who to call. So I called AA in that city. And I said, I'm Frank Milos, and I'm supposed to give an A talk at a banquet right next door to your city. And the guy said, where? And I told him. And, he said, and I said, all I'm going to ask you to do is, could you have somebody go over there and just tell them I can't come? I'm fogged in. I just won't be there. And I'm supposed to talk in five hours. And he said, we don't talk to those people. <laughs> now, you, now, I understand that it sounds funny. But when your life is at stake, and the unity that's necessary to make this thing stay healthy and well, there is no laughter in the death of people. Because we think we have the luxury of disliking each other. They think that almost 90 million people have come through the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous. There are two million left. We used to grow at 20% a year. That's in the forward of the first edition. Now we grow less than the population growth. AA doesn't work. It has nothing to do with AA not working. See, I'm a believer in uh, when I drank, I didn't want anybody to water down my drinks. And there's only re one reason I don't want you to water down my drinks, because it doesn't work if you dilute my drink. AA does not work when we dilute that. And we'll be 70 years old, Alcoholics Anonymous, in Toronto. And the sad thing about it is when, when we were in Montreal, I sat on the second balcony of the Olympic Stadium, because this will be my seventh international conference. And they said, with all the people that were in New Orleans, please stand up. And in New Orleans, we filled the Superdome. And on the second balcony of the Olympic Stadium, I was the only one that stood. There's a sadness about that. And you'd have to be blind not to see the visitors. They come for a day, they come for a week, they come for a month, they come for two months, they come for a year. And we don't even know their names, and we don't miss them because they never even left an impression. And then we come to conferences and we give people who have one day. And I love it. And you are the future of Alcoholics Anonymous, and don't think that doesn't frighten me. <laughs> And we never stop to think, where are all the people who are had 39 years? 38, 37, 36, 35, 34. It's almost like we don't even notice. They're all missing. Tens of thousands came those years. And yet Alcoholics Anonymous works. But there's something about people like me that refuse to do 
refuse to realize that this is a program of recovery, not a program about drinking. This is a program about change. All you hear all many places, drink, drink, drink. Newcomers don't need to hear about drinking. They are the world's authority about drinking. There's nothing about drinking they don't know. <laughs> what they don't know is how do you live with you and not have to drink to stand it? How come I have to medicate myself to attain normal? That's the question. And very rarely do we address that. When was the last time you said to your newcomers, write down a list of what your moral beliefs are? Because folks, we're going to ask them soon to take a fearless and searching moral inventory. Never hear about that. You hear about drunk. You hear about drunk and the fun of drunk. Well, it's easier to talk about the fun of drinking than talk about the truth that this kills most people like me. I'll tell you something about me, and I guess you got to start. I never was a social drinker. I wouldn't want to be a social drinker. There are a lot of people here that are less than a year sober, or less than a, three or four months. I know I saw them standing up and they were making a lot of noise and I'm, I'm pleased that they're here. And I'd like to ask one or two of them a simple question. If I had a pill that could make you a social drinker, thereby you could drink with impunity, drink and no problems result therefrom. Would you take that pill? And all you have to do is take the pill one time and you're going to be a social drinker the rest of your life. Is there anybody who would take that pill? No. <laughs> this girl. So far, you're the only honest newcomer in the room. <laughs> Now here's the strange part of that. You really wouldn't. Because you see what happens in Alcoholics Anonymous is we use words, but we really don't even know the meaning of those words. We can't even make pictures of the reality of those words. I offered to make you a social drinker. Do you know any social drinkers? Have you ever thought to yourself, I'm going to go out tonight, I'm going to call one of my social drinker friends. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've had a bad day, I'm going to go and get loose tonight, I think. Uh, let me see, who do I know that doesn't drink? <laughs> Did you ever really watch social drinkers drink? Here's what you see. When a social drinker meets another social drinker, and says to that other social drinker, how would you like to stop and have a drink? The other social drinker may say, okay. And now you gotta keep watching this. <laughs> and they go into a bar and they have a drink and then they go home. <laughs> how would you like to live like that? <laughs> Social drinkers, when they sit at a bar, and you'll, you'll see this all over the world, they will sit at a bar, the bartender will give them their drinks, and then they will turn away from the drink, <laughs> face each other, and talk. <laughs> How'd you like to live like that one day at a time? Hmm. 
one day I was flying to give a talk. I, I know you heard this story for Cecil up in Prince Albert, Saskatchewan, Canada. And I was flying from Naples, Florida. Well, I went from 85 degrees to 60 below zero. So that, uh, that, that gets your attention. And uh, on the fifth plane, they had these free drinks for people who had enough courage to fly this thing they call an airplane <laughs> over the frozen tundra. And there were two young men to my right, and they ordered, I listened, they ordered Molson Lager. And I was a beer drinker 112 pounds ago. And uh, I watched them pour their drink in a plastic cup like that. And it was beautiful. It was the bottom of the plastic cup became gold. And above the gold was a white cloud. <laughs> and it just hovered over the gold. And I looked at that Molson lager and I turned my head and I'm thinking, I'll look at the frozen tundra. <laughs> And I turn back a minute later, or two or three, and the cloud was starting to dissipate. And they hadn't touched the drink. And I turned away and looked out that window again, and I started to talk to myself. I thought, this can't be happening. How would anybody disgrace a drink like that? And I turned back and I looked, and now the white cloud was gone. And I wanted to kill him. <laughs> How about this? Ask your social drinker's friend after they have their second drink, would you like another? And here's what they'll say. No, thank you. <laughs> I'm starting to feel it. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha. I'm thinking to myself, you're shitting me, now it's time to drink. <laughs> the point of drinking is to feel it. You don't stop when that happens. You start when that happens. <laughs> Unbelievable. Who wants to be a social drinker? What excitement is that? They go out at night and they know where they're going. <laughs> they know who they're going to be with. Ha, 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 ha. They know when they're coming home and how they're going to get there. What kind of life is that? Where's the danger? Where's the romance? <laughs> you hear a lot about God and Alcoholics Anonymous, and my first, my first uh, brush with God was uh, in a school with a woman who walked in, and she was dressed in black and white, and she said she was going to teach us about sin. And she told us that there were two kinds of sin. There was a venial sin and that, and it was like a scroll with thousands of things on there. And, and I'm only seven, eight years old and, and I'm listening to this and don't listen to your parents. Take things that don't belong to you. Ba, 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 ba. And all these things are sins. And she said, and if you do these things and die, you've offended God and God is going to take you to a place of punishment. We call it purgatory and you're going to have to burn there for a while. <laughs> now, I don't know if I'm seven or eight, and I know that I've done some of the things on that list, and I don't know about you, but when you're seven or eight, three or four thousand years seems like a long time, <laughs> and I'm not all that thrilled about burning. I remember... A few years later, that woman dressed in black and white came into the classroom and she said, boys, I want you to stay and I want all the girls to leave. 
I thought, oh boy. And uh, the girls left and this woman in black and white said, uh, boys, God sees in the dark. <laughs> I thought to myself, but he can't see under the covers. <laughs> but that's the beginning of a dirty little secret that I do not share with anyone else. I do not go to the playground and say, okay, let's play ball, but before we play ball, let me tell you about the tent I made last night. <laughs> Do you really believe this is my story? I'm telling them your story. <laughs> Uh, my father was a drunk. His father was a drunk. And, um, but my father loved me. And he wanted, my father was a factory worker. And he wanted, uh, he had two sons. And he wanted for them that which he did not have for himself. And he thought education was a secret. And his people were from Lithuania. My mother's people were from Ireland. And we lived uh, near the stockyards in Chicago. <laughs> And uh, my dad uh, said he would work as many jobs as necessary to get his sons what he never got. My father never uh, went to high school, nor did my mother. And they thought in America that the answer was education. And so my dad worked multiple jobs to see to it that I could have all the education I wanted. And he wanted desperately for me to be somebody because he felt he was nobody. And I remember growing up, my dad says, I want you to be somebody, Frank. And I really mean it. I want you to work hard and try hard and study hard. And I want you to be somebody. And you know, I guess I had alcoholic thinking from the time I've been 10 and 11 and 12. Because here's what I heard when he said that, Frank, you are nobody. And your job in life is to be somebody. And I don't know how to be somebody. Because no kid knows how to be somebody. And one day my dad said, uh, I met somebody. He said, his, 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 he's a lawyer. And Frank, it would be wonderful if you could be a lawyer. And I didn't know what a lawyer was. When you're, when you're, when you're playing in the field, you're playing in the prairie. Nobody, nobody who's nine knows what a lawyer is. There's no television. Maybe they do now by watching television. You don't know back then. They want to be race car drivers. And, pilots and quarterbacks and policemen and firemen and baseball players. You got, in the, you got in the field with a bunch of kids to roast potatoes and burn Christmas trees. And you say, oh, by the way, I want to be a lawyer. They look at you like you're crazy. Because who knows what a lawyer is? 1961, I became a lawyer here, sworn in by the Supreme Court in this, in this city. And that day I didn't know what a lawyer was, and I was one. <laughs> and I was so afraid for the next 32 years that you'd find out that I really don't feel like one. I knew what I wanted to do when I was uh, with the rest of my life when I was about 11. One afternoon when I was 11, the girl next door and I went out in her backyard and in those days, we had uh, clotheslines. They didn't have dryers. And what they would do is they'd put blankets and sheets and stuff on the clothesline. And that would form a tent. <laughs> <laughs> and her and I went into that tent. And I discovered that afternoon what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. <laughs> I wanted to be a gynecologist. <laughs> a 
Hey, I did my best. I got, <laughs> but I got, I had to finish being a lawyer. I never wanted to be a guy who needed help from strangers. There's nothing about me that says, it wouldn't it be lovely someday when you're still a young man to have to go into a room full of strangers and to ask for help with living. I've never known anybody who signed their yearbook. What do you want to do? when you grow up or with the rest of your life. Well, I'd like to join A&A &A and go to meetings for the rest of my life. How about you, Slick? I wanted to grow up to be a man and be happy, period. To grow up to be a man and be happy, period. And every newcomer I've ever met in my life has wanted nothing more than that, to grow up and be happy. I don't remember ever being happy. I have no recollection of a teenage years where I was happy. People around me would use words that I had no understanding of. Here's a great one. Comfortable. I've never known comfortable. It's hard to be comfortable with secrets. How about this one? Enough. <laughs> Simple little word, enough. I have no idea what enough means. I can't get enough power, praise, money, fame, acceptance, love, sex. That's changing, I'd like to tell you. <laughs> Wouldn't you like to meet that Levitra woman? <laughs> I say to my wife, God, she's pretty. <laughs> When I drank, I felt better. I drank to feel better. When I drank, I got comfortable. When I drank, I knew happy. I did not drink to degrade myself to abuse my wife, to be a degenerate father, to shame myself or hurt your daughter or kill your son. In 1982, I walked into a room full of newcomers, which I've conducted newcomers classes all over North America. And I've done this to tens and tens of thousands, 100,000 newcomers. I've asked them to tell me what an alcoholic was. And young lady, I'm just going to use you as an example, but I have to talk to somebody. But you represent everybody here that's new. We hear the term alcoholic in Alcoholics Anonymous, but I don't know that we really know what we're talking about. And if we're, if we're not if we both don't see and feel the same thing, and if I say dog and you picture cat, you and I will never ever be able to relate or converse with one another. So I asked them, see there's no 
definition of alcoholic and Alcoholics Anonymous. I mean, it's not in the book. It's in none of the literature. They have stories and descriptions, but there's no definition. Wouldn't it be nice for there to be an official definition of alcoholic? Because we could then see we don't belong and we could leave. <laughs> see, there's kind of an illusion in Alcoholics Anonymous that the newcomer comes here to convince himself he ought to stay. No, 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 no. You're here to justify your departure, and I know that. <laughs> so I asked the people in that group to make an alcoholic for me in the laboratory of our minds. And they thought, dude, this is nuts. This guy's got to be crazy. And I said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stand before you holding an invisible test tube. <laughs> And what I'm going to ask you to do is to put in the ingredients that you know are necessary to constitute an alcoholic. And when we're all through making an alcoholic in the laboratories of our mind, looking in this big, heavy, invisible test tube, we'll know what the subject matter is. And I held this big, heavy, invisible test tube, and it seemed like forever. And there was silence. And he said it, newcomers cannot stand silence, because then they start hearing the voices. <laughs> and a little girl who was 16 or 17 said, put in fear. And a man who was 60 some years old and sober two or three weeks said, and put in depression. Then somebody said, put in self-loathing. Put in negative self-image. Another person said, put in loneliness. Put in anger, somebody said. Put in perfectionism, someone said. Put in controlling, someone said. Someone said, put in remorse. And then there was a whole series of guilt. Put in guilt, put in guilt. We had all kinds of Catholics that day. <laughs> And uh, put in inferiority, someone said. And then someone said, put in superiority as if in the same vessel. Inferiority and superiority could both live comfortably together. <laughs> <laughs> And they went on and on and on and on until the test tube was full. And then I realized that they knew. They never read the book and they knew. Because one thing they never put in. What do you think that was, young lady? They never put in alcohol. You think that's strange? Mm-mm. These people come here knowing that alcohol is but a symptom of the problem. And we talk to them about drinking instead of hope and recovery. So I asked them to put in some alcohol in the test tube, which was me. And here's what we observed in the laboratories of our mind. If you put just enough alcohol in that test tube, what happens is a miracle. Fear starts to go away. Yeah. Anger starts to disappear. <coughs> Music, romance, hope, dreams, depression is diluted. That's why I drink. But for a strange reason known only to God, for some people in the world, if you keep doing that over a period of time, this terrible thing happens. The benefits of alcohol diminish. And after a period of time, and the time is different for everyone. Instead of diluting and refreshing and benefiting and enhancing, that alcohol 
has a reverse effect. And if you drink after drink stops working for you, I guarantee you, you will know a new fear, a greater self-hatred, deeper depressions. Now I asked these people who conducted this test to take the alcohol out of the test tube. And sometimes in Alcoholics Anonymous you hear people talk, just don't drink, as if that's a new concept. <laughs> Everyone in that young man's life has said, just don't drink. Because they love him. They love him. So when he comes to us, we're going to say, don't drink, as if we'll save him. Drink as much as you can, as long as you can. And when you don't want to or can't drink anymore, come here. Now, you may have already done that, and today may be the day that you say, I can't live like that anymore. There's nothing in the book Alcoholics Anonymous that says, do not drink. The only reference to drinking in the book Alcoholics Anonymous is, and I quote, if you're not convinced, try some drinking. Drink. Drink a couple of drinks and try to stop drinking. Experiment with drinking. It says that in the book. Drink. This is about recovery. When you're a little boy and you're a little girl, you want to be happy. When I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, I was 34 years old, and I had surprised my father. I had become somebody. I had made more money in that year I came in than my father made in his entire life. I wasn't happy. And I had to come into a room full of strangers and admit, I don't know how to live as Frank Milos. I don't even know who he is. I know he's not the kid that was going to grow up and be happy. And they said to me, Frank, you can't drink and recover. So what you got to do, Frank, is you got to bring no drinking to the pot. It's like playing poker and you ante up, you ante up not drinking. The goal of Alcoholics Anonymous is not to get you to stop drinking. Because if you take alcohol out of your system, you still got all that stuff in the test tube. And you will have to drink or die. Sometimes alcoholics of my type have to drink to live. The goal of Alcoholics Anonymous is to take the stuff out of the alcohol, out of the test tube. Because the actions of Alcoholics Anonymous are designed to work just like alcohol worked when it was wonderful. To the proportion that you take these actions, anger subsides, self-loathing disappears, perfectionism leave. They have things here they call promises, and they occur, they say, all the time. You will know a new freedom and a new happiness. That's what I wanted when I was six, and 16, and 26, and 36. But you have to work for them. And you can't get them and drink. You can't drink 
and recover. Only Alanons can. <laughs> That's just an observation. <laughs> a is about hope for a better life without secrets, without guilt, without living in the past. There's an illusion in Alcoholics Anonymous that the biggest recovery occurs from day one to the first year or some such thing. The most dynamic change occurs in the first week or month or year. You know that's not true. Most often, the greatest recovery occurs between the fifth and sixth or the 15th and 16th or the 21st or 22nd year or the 30th year or the 40th year. Because what we deal with is an ever-changing me who lives in an ever-changing world. And I must make continuous surrenders to have that sense of comfort. The, word, the road gets narrower as you are older and more sober. I had great tolerance for my conduct when I was a young man. My wife was married. <laughs> I got to tell the George story and get out of here. How much time do I have? How much? I'll do it. God, I wish I had the power. I wish I had the power to just uh, touch you. How old are you? 19. God, I wish I could do it. I don't have the power. I don't have the words. I was giving a talk one day and they told me there was a big storm coming and they said, Frank, there's a, this terrible electrical storm coming and this, it was in Indiana someplace and they said, at any point you could, we could lose the electricity and you're, you're, it's done. Step off the podium and the meeting's over. We don't have a backup system. And I thought to myself, what if there's somebody like you in the audience who's never going to be here again? This is your one day, one time. And what if I only had 30 seconds, not 20 minutes, to say something before the electricity came and went off? What would be the most important thing I could say to this person who this might be the only time they ever hear? And I knew exactly what, and I said, my name is Frank, and before the lights go out, I want you to know there is hope here. There is hope here. Here, young man, you can dream about what you want to be, who you want to become, and how you want to live. And here, people very much different than you will share with you their hope and you can be whatever you can dream <coughs> and that's Alcoholics Anonymous but you gotta work for it and the first thing you gotta do is come to grips with the fact that for some reason, known only to God, people like you and people like me need help. 
But once we get it, we get power. One day, you will say or do something that will literally change the life of another human being, and you will not know that you've done it. You ask yourself, as we get older, what's it all about? Maybe it's just the fact that one day you say or do something that in some way changes the life of another human being. Maybe that's all it really is all about. I don't know. I don't know. If they want to talk to you about drinking, go someplace else. Find somebody else. Find somebody who wants to talk about hope and love and forgiveness. So you don't have to feel that you're not really one of God's kids. You're just some kind of freak of nature. There's some reason for people like you, and there's some reason for people like me. I don't know what it is, but maybe it is to talk to each other and to say to each other, there is hope here. On November 3rd, 1971, I called Alcoholics Anonymous. I was a big shot. I was a big shot. big shot, up and coming superstar lawyer. I had called Alcoholics Anonymous three years before, and when they answered, I hung up. Because I was ashamed I made that call. People that are like me don't need help. They need a different wife. <laughs> Less children. More money. Greater victories. I knew there's something to do with my drinking. So I took a trip to Puerto Rico, conducted an experiment with rum and hope. <laughs> well, after three days, hope checked out of the hotel and I was stuck with <laughs> Two years after that, I called Alcoholics Anonymous and I hung up again. Once I got a recording and once I got a live voice, and when I hung up, I, I said to myself, good for you, Frank, you did something about your drinking. <laughs> but on this day, for some strange reason, I, got a, I called the central office in Chicago, and I got a woman, and she said, um, this is Alcoholics Anonymous, can I help you? And I don't want to talk about help. I said, no, I'm, I'm, you can give me some information. See, the word help, Help put you up here and me down here. I, I don't want to play that game. After all, I am somebody. I said, I want some information. She said, what is your name? I thought to myself, what are you, nuts? <laughs> I'm going to give her my name. She's going to tell everybody in Chicago, guess who called Alcoholics Anonymous? <laughs> then she wanted to know my address how old I was, and she wanted to know what I did for a living. You think I'm going to tell her that stuff. Well, she said to me, if you don't tell me these things, I can't help you because we, we are all volunteers here, she said. And with this information, I'm going to call a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and they're going to call you at 6 o'clock. This is nine o'clock in the morning. She's talking about six o'clock at night. I said, lady, are you, you don't know anything about alcoholism. It's nine o'clock in the morning by six o'clock. I'm going to decide, I'll just have a couple of drinks. I won't need you at six. So anyway, she got me to give her my name, Frank. And I lived in a town, and I 
gave her an address, and I told her how old I was. And then I told her I was a lawyer. I said, I can't hear you. I said, I'm a lawyer. I said, I can't hear you. I said, I'm a lawyer. She said, oh. I thought I was the first lawyer that ever called Alcoholics Anonymous. I said, I don't think this is going to work. She says, listen, there's a place you could go in Chicago and talk to alcoholics. She gave me an address. It was on the near north side. I'm a suburban guy. I live in a big house on top of a hill. You know why I built that house on top of that hill? Because everybody can see that house. It's more important that you're impressed with the house than I'm impressed with the house. Because, see, I do everything for your approval. Somehow, because if you approve of me, somehow maybe that'll transfer and I'll approve of me. So I live my whole life seeking the approval of others, sometimes even strangers. Isn't that a sad way to live for a guy who's bright? That sad way to live. So I went to that place. I went like you would go. I had just come back from a trip, I don't know. I had a wonderful suntan. I always have a wonderful suntan. <laughs> I put on a silk imported suit, silk tie, gold pin right here. I had a diamond pinky. I got into my new Cadillac. I went around my big circular drive, and I went to join Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> I drive into the city of Chicago. I'm looking at this address. The neighborhood is deteriorating. I'm thinking, what's going on here? It's a storefront building those days, right? I don't know, you weren't, you weren't sober then. How do you know? I pulled up right in front of that building. I think, my God, they'll see me come in. They'll see me drive. They'll say, hey, you can't come in here. This is for alcoholics. See, when I go to my country club, they say, good morning, Mr. Milos. We'll take your car. That's what I expect. That's what I lived with. They didn't say, good morning, Mr. Milos. We'll take your car when I drove up to that storefront building. When I walked in, a young man with a white shirt and tie said, you need help? <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, what are you talking about? Do I need help? I think he didn't see my car. He didn't see my suit. <laughs> he didn't see my diamond ring. He didn't see my suntan. You know what he saw? He saw the fear and hopelessness in my eyes. And I stayed all afternoon with that kid and I told him some truth. <laughs> the one thing I told him was I did not want to be an unfaithful father, a husband. And that's the lifestyle I assumed. And I couldn't stop. And I didn't want to be a father to three little girls who found their father naked, passed out, and drew a picture for their mother, anatomically correct, <laughs> at the age of five. And I didn't want to wake up. My wife says, here's the picture your daughter painted of you this morning. I don't want to live like that. I'm ashamed of that. I can't live like that. When they were born, each one of them, I promised, in this house, there will not be fear or filth or screams or blood. There'll be a consistent pattern of understanding in dialogue. That's not the way it turned out. I will never do, I said to myself, what my father did to my mother. No, I didn't. I did more. And when I married that woman, I loved her. And I promised to be a good and loving and faithful husband. And I didn't know how to do it. But when I just drank just enough, I felt entitled somehow. 
I left that young man when he asked me to go to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, and uh, I told him I had to go home to have dinner because it was getting to be 5.30, and I lied to him because I, I don't go home for dinner. I never go home for dinner now because the kids are still up, and I don't want them to see me. You know, and my wife doesn't care if I come home for dinner. The only thing my wife cares about is that I take a shower before I come home so she doesn't have to smell her. I don't want to live like that. If I called my wife after I got rid of that kid and I told her I'd gone to Alcoholics Anonymous and she said we're eating at 6, we're having chicken and she hung up. And I went home at 5 to 6 and I saw three little girls who had computer eyes. And the computer eyes of alcoholics, children of my type, do this. What kind of day did daddy have? What kind of day did daddy have? See, they have to do that because they got to discern immediately when you walk in. Is this safe? Because I'm likely to just grab them and hug them and tell them I love them. They're the most beautiful little girls in the whole world. Or I'm just as, just as, if I'm full of fear and I'm hurt and I feel so dirty, I see a shoe live, laying in the middle of the living room and I'll just knock them off the chair. And my kids have to know what kind of day daddy had. This is alcoholism. Ha ha about drinking, ha ha about the jokes. Phone rang at six o'clock. I knew who it was, it was Alcoholics Anonymous. I didn't want that phone to ring. I didn't want Alcoholics Anonymous. And I heard the worst voice I've ever heard in my life. Here's what I heard. Frank! <laughs> my name is George. I got your name from central office. I understand you got a problem with booze. <laughs> I said, uh, yeah, George, uh, but I went to an A club. And he said, uh, I'm going to come over and talk to you about it. You're drinking. I thought to myself, come to my house? How could I do that to my wife and kids? I mean, bring an alcoholic into my house? I mean, how do you arrive in an old, beat-up Volkswagen bus with a peace sign? I don't know. All the neighbors see. I got this big house on top of this hill. You're going to tool around my circular drive and they're all going to say, oh my God, there's alcoholics going to Frank's house. <laughs> he wants to come over. I just got new carpeting. White. Cloud white carpeting. Can you imagine saying, come on in, alcoholic. <laughs> So I lied to him. See, I never wanted to be a lawyer. Never. I'm not a lawyer anymore. I run two companies now. 32 years was enough of taking money under false pretenses. <laughs> but I took a lot. But I was destined to be a lawyer because I have a gift. God gave me a gift. He also gave me some other things that aren't so neat, but he gave me a gift. And the gift that I have enabled me to be a tremendously successful lawyer. It's simple. I can lie with no thought process. <laughs> you just put pressure on me and I lie. It's like songs to a composer. Poems to a poet. It just comes. And he says, I want to come over. And I said, you can't because i got to go to a PTA meeting. I had never been to a PTA meeting in my life. I had never known a human being who had ever gone to a PTA meeting. Isn't that a wonderful gift? And he said, what time is that meeting over? <laughs> How do I know what time that meeting's over? So I say, 10 o'clock. I'll be there at 10.15. <laughs> I said then, well, but after the regular scheduled PTA meeting, we have a board director's meeting and I'm on the board. What time is that meeting over? <laughs> 11 o'clock, I'll be there at 11.15. Well, you're not gonna believe this, George, but after the board director's meeting, there's a finance committee meeting and I'm chairman of the finance committee. What time is that meeting over? <laughs> and I told them, 
these words. Listen, leave your name and phone number, and when it's more convenient, I'll get back to you. And he said, listen, goof. <laughs> you disgust me. And then he swore bad words. <laughs> and he said, listen, goof, if it's not too inconvenient, let me ask you a couple questions and then I'll leave you alone. Okay, I'm thinking. This is the same guy that three hours before was telling a stranger, I don't want to live like that. Funny how God's grace is fleeting. Funny how my mind works. He said, what are you, somebody important? I said, yeah. He says, what are you, somebody famous? I said, yeah. He said, what are you, a lawyer or something? <laughs> and I said, yeah. And he said, listen, famous, important lawyer. I'm a lawyer. They gave me your name when they called me to call you. I've practiced law for 20 years. 10 miles away from where you live, Mr. Famous, important lawyer, and I've never heard of you. <laughs> and I said, what time are you coming? <laughs> and he said, I'm not coming because you're not worth it. Didn't you, George? Stand up. Stand up. <laughs> and you hear people, I don't know how to make a 12-step call. Just tell them they're worth it. <laughs> See, I'm a kind of alcoholic that you say, Frank, you can have all this. You can have these promises. You can have a new life. I think to myself, yeah, maybe, but I'm not ready for it. I'm not ready to take those steps. I'm not ready to get those promises. I'll just, I'm not ready yet. I'll think about it. But you tell me, listen, you, you can't have it. I'm the kind of alcoholic that says, you try to stop me. <laughs> so I said, where do you live? He said, you want to come to me? You, come to, you want to talk to me? Come to my house. He said, I live in Beverly Hills in Chicago. I thought, well, I'm getting a good branch anyway. <laughs> I went to his house, he didn't let me in. He made me stay in the, outside the front door. I often wondered, I said to myself, this is weird. He's a big mansion-like house in Beverly Hills, and he says, wait there. <laughs> About nine, 10, 11 months later, we're in a coffee shop, he said, remember day you come to my house? And they got a terrible voice. <laughs> I sound more like George than he does, doesn't I? <laughs> I said, yeah, I often wondered, why didn't you let me in? He said, we just got new carpeting. <laughs> A couple of years later, George decided he wasn't an alcoholic anymore. He started to drink wine. And then he drank something else, and then something else. And one day, I'm walking into a drugstore to buy packs of cigarettes. That's when I used to smoke. I'd never been in this drugstore in my whole life. And who's in the drugstore? Coming back from a three-day drunk, but George. And I said, George, do you need help? And that's his sobriety date. He helped me, and I helped him. How could that be but for the grace of God? Thank you very much.